My name is Richard Sparks. I own two personal training gyms. I own a uh, one-on-one personal training gym. and I own a group fitness facility. Um, I employ about 15 people. Uh, I'm a NPC bodybuilder currently, hopefully an IFBB bodybuilder soon. Um, I was 2019's Mr. Kentucky in men's physique. I have two overall championships uh, in the NPC, and I missed my pro card by one spot. Uh, hoping to go back to Kentucky and reclaim my uh, state title again this year and then hopefully turn pro this year is kind of the goal. Um, other than that, I have a fiance, which is a uh, wellness competitor. And uh, that's pretty much it. Pretty much sums up what I am. <laughs> it sounds like you've had some good success in the sport so far, but how'd you actually get into it? So uh, funny story about me is um, I was, you know, I was just kind of working out. I think most people kind of start out that way. They don't start out like just wanting to get into bodybuilding. So uh, I started working out, uh, getting into pretty good shape. And I had a uh, trainer at the facility I used to work at. She was our head trainer and she competed and she looked at me and she goes, you know, if you really wanted to, you could probably work hard enough to become a men's physique pro. And I was like, well, what the hell is that? I didn't know what the hell it was. And she's like, oh, these, uh, they're like a slender beach body build. And this was back when, I mean, this, I started in 2017. So, you know, this is when like 165, 162 pounds, I mean, that was Olympia level, you know what I mean? Um, so she was like, well, you know, if you work hard enough, you could probably, you could probably do it. So after she said, I started looking up everything. I didn't, I didn't realize that here in Louisville had two of the biggest shows in the region. At the time, I believe they were the two biggest shows in the region. Um, and uh, so I was like, well, hell, why not? You know, I, 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 miss, I, I was a wrestler in high school. I was a really competitive wrestler. And I kind of miss uh, having competition. So I was like, well, you know, I, I really don't want to get back into like uh, wrestling at my age. So uh, hell, why not give it a try? Uh, did my first show about, man, that must have been like probably about seven months later got my ass handed to me. I coached myself, got my butt handed to me and I uh, didn't think I'd ever do a show again. And then as I'm walking off stage, one of the guys that beat me, I was looking at him. I was like, man, I got to keep going. I can't go out that way. And so I did one more show uh, that year and I got third and open, which I was pretty proud of. And to be honest, I haven't lost my class since. So I've, uh, I've won two out of the four overalls that I've been in. What do you think you learned the most out of that first like seven month experience? Actually, you know, like you said, coaching yourself and going through all this stuff yourself. Do you think, you know, what do you think you learned the most? You know, it's funny because a lot of people and me included say, hey, man, the best thing to do is to hire a coach that knows what they're doing right away. But I learned a lot about myself. You know, I, I kind of knew what I was doing, but I didn't. I didn't realize that to get to that percentage of body fat, that stage lean body fat, you really have to trick your body into doing it because I didn't understand that, you know, your hormones tank and you know, all your, your body is trying to do is preserve fat. So you live healthy. So you have fat stores. And I didn't realize that you had to manipulate things until that very first show. Uh, I remember my leptin hormones were tanked and, um, and I didn't know it. So I started looking up. I was like, man, my calories were like 1500. I couldn't lose weight. And I started looking it up, trying to figure out what was going on. And I realized that I take my leptin hormone, which is, you know, I won't get into the science behind it, but uh, you can't lose weight if your hormones are tanked. And uh, so I, uh, I did a refeed and I started losing weight again. So, I mean, I would have never learned that if I, uh, if I didn't do it by myself. So you learn a lot about your, I mean, you know, not everybody's made out to do bodybuilding, but if anybody's thinking about it, I think they should do at least one show. And and the reason I say that is this because you'll learn so much about who you are, what you could push through. I mean, there's three. I remember one time there was three nights in a row I didn't sleep at all. I was starving. Like I, I just couldn't sleep. So you just you learn so much more about what you can endure and how tough you are if you could do a bodybuilding show. So I always suggest to everybody who's uh, who's weightlifted in the past or maybe did strongman or, or powerlifting or just general health stuff. You know, do one show and just learn what you're all about. Cause you'll learn a lot about yourself and you definitely won't regret the experience. And was that like an overwhelming kind of scary place to be, you know, with your, you know, you doing it by yourself and your hormones are changing and you can't sleep. You can't, you know, do what you thought would be possible. Like how did you kind of handle all that? That was, that was probably, some of the worst days of my life. I mean, I remember there's a photo. I wish, uh, you know, I would have 
I sent this photo to you, you could put it up there. But there was a photo that I took of myself at my check-in that morning after the third day. And you can just see it in my eyes that like I was just nowhere to be found. You know, I just started out my personal training career too, which was even tougher because I was trying to build a book and I had no idea how to do that either. And um, man, like it, 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 what makes it really funny um, is it makes it really scary to me. So many people that take on these coaching gigs that don't know what they're doing in this industry. And yeah, you know, I see blood work all the time uh, from my clients as a coach now. And I'm thinking back like, wow, I wonder what I would have been back then. Um, but it kind of, it's kind of scary because I have people that, you know, we have people that are prepping clients and uh, for shows that had the same knowledge I did back then. And they don't know that type of stuff, you know, and then they're reaching out to coaches like me saying, Hey, I have this contest prep client who's, you know, five weeks out, we can't lose a, you know, a little bit of weight at all. She's at 1200 calories. What do I do? It's like feed her food. Shockingly enough, that will work. <laughs> um, but that's probably, I would say the scariest thing is I learned that I wasn't good enough yet to coach myself. Now I did go on to coach myself to, uh, for two more years for the rest of that year and the next year. And I did win an overall championship. Uh, my first overall championship was one when I coached myself and it's still to this date, the best I've looked, but even then, like, I mean, it was, you know, to inflict pain upon yourself to know like every little change that you do within your plan. It's a lot easier to do a change plans when it's somebody else. that's not, you know, it's not you that's starving. Hey, yeah, you'd be all right. Go ahead and lower food. But, but yeah, it's, it's a tough job because, you know, you have to dictate the refeed. You have to be, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to really look at yourself from an outside of perspective. Like, Hey, am I ready? Hey, am I on the right path? Um, since then I have hired coaches, so, uh, I'm just too busy of a man to worry about myself right now. So after I got third in North Americans, I, uh, ended up, that was, I hired a coach for that show. And then after that, I went back to coaching myself for a little bit and, and it was one of those things that, like, you know, I, I prepped for a show last year. I wasn't coming in right. I thought I was overtraining. I was doing, like, two hours uh, uh, every morning on the Stairmaster. I didn't hold on to the rails at, like, a 10 speed. Uh, to this day, I don't realize how in the hell I did it. Um, and then I was training six days a week uh, about eight weeks out. And I was going by the way I felt. I felt great, but the weight wasn't coming off. So I ended up pulling out of that show because I wasn't ready. And I toned it back to five days a week training, one hour of cardio, and my body responded really well. <clears throat> Toward the end, I was getting ready for the Kentucky Open again, uh, and I was wanting to defend my title because that would have been 2021. And um, about, you know, a couple weeks out, I realized I still wasn't getting lean enough. So I went and got blood work done, and my blood work markers were like red flags shooting up everywhere. And I'm a big preacher of getting blood work done because you don't know what's going on with you internally. So when I got that blood work done, that's right then and there. I'm like, I'm never going to coach myself again because clearly I don't have a clear mind to force myself into going to get the labs done, doing what's right as far as, you know, cardio based and, and training based. I'm always going to push the envelope a whole lot more than I should because I feel like this is what it takes. You know, right now um, I hired Jeff Black, which is a uh, functional health nutrition uh, type coach out of uh, Nashville. And within two, three months, he had all my markers fixed, like all of it. Um, and he's, he's having me train four days a week. I'm the biggest I've ever been. I'm 210 pounds right now. And, um, and that's what I needed. I just needed that outsider looking at me and saying, Richard, this is what you need to do. And then I could focus on my businesses and do what I need to do there. It, it's so much detail. I mean, I remember you know, when I, when I lost out on my IFBB pro card, the, the difference between me and the second place guy was so minimal. And throughout that time, I was thinking about what I could have done better, slight things. Cause I mean, you're talking about, I mean, a difference between seeing a guy that's on stage at 5% body fat and, and three and a half, four percent 4% body fat. It's like, it might be a difference between first and second call outs. Like, I mean, it's, it's such a huge difference and it's minor things. Like maybe I was, using a measuring cup instead of weighing my food like I should have, or uh, maybe those extra two chunks of pieces of chicken I threw in my mouth that I wasn't supposed to eat caused that. Or, I mean, it's so very minimal. And, you know, the, the strain on the body is already hard enough. 
So if you have that strain on your mind, it's even worse, which, you know, you have to obviously buy into your coach's philosophy too and whatever he's preaching, because if you're second guessing what he's doing, and that's going to be another burden on your brain. So um, you're 100% right. It's so much easier to, to get a, a coach that you trust fall in line, just do what you're told and, and trust the process and, and, and expect the uh, best at the very end. Uh, let them worry about all the issues <laughs> and just try to focus on sleep, hydration, food, sodium, all those things. And you mentioned like the fine details of all this stuff and everything that goes into play with it. How do you think technology is making a big or, or in a difference really how do you think it's making a difference in the world of bodybuilding it's making it more and more advanced and it's also you know it, it's allowing people to reach sizes obviously we we've never seen before and you know it's funny because I, you know i brought this conversation up plenty of times when it comes to arnold schwarzenegger as great as his physique was all-time great whatever he couldn't turn pro with that physique he has now like if you took Arm Schwarzenegger as his very peak and put him in a national show to turn pro, he wouldn't. That's how far the the sport has evolved, um, and a lot of it is science. It's it's science in biomechanics at the tip of your hand. I mean, you know, I follow I follow like the gurus, um, like hypertrophy coach in one training. These people are so far advanced in in training the muscles from the length into the shortened position stuff that you know a lot of people just don't understand um and it allows for a very complete physique i mean um technology i mean once again blood work you know if, if there's a something that you're reacting to fair like heck i just sit my hair in to find out if i'm allergic to over 200 different types of foods you know what I mean? You think Arnold was able to do that back in 1974? No. So um, now on the, the positive side, yes, but there's also a negative to that. I think a negative to that is people that are pushing the envelope, which we've seen in deaths and bodybuilding, whether that be diuretics, um, the steroid protocols, and some of the other things that some of these, these athletes are doing, they're pushing the envelope way too far because they think that they have this blood work to fall back on and all these other things. Um, and then of course, social media. I mean, I think one thing bad about, I'm, I'm more of a, a probably, I probably would have done better in the nineties with bodybuilding. Uh, Cause I'm kind of an old school guy, but you know, social media, the platform, everybody, you know, you know, everybody wants the, the glamor before, you know, they win something. And it's absolutely insane to me. You know, I have, you know, I, I'm, I log on to Instagram and I, you know, I'm looking through the reels, trying to find something funny. And all I see is these people who, who have never placed top five in an open division posting all these hype videos about turning pro, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but there's no such category for 120 pounder to be a pro right now. I mean, it's, it, it's, so it, there's a plus to the technology and then there's a kind of a, a drawback and, you know, photo editing technology, once again, you know, um, the guy that's exposing all those influencers right now, I'm not sure if you follow him, but it's, uh, I think it's Goob U2 or Goob 2U or something like that. I've seen that, but I wasn't really sure what it was all about. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he's a, he's a knowledgeable guy in Photoshopping and he's exposing these people that have the top, like there's top five people in the world in their division in bodybuilding who are editing their photos. It's like, you're already one of the best bodies in the world. Like it's hard to obtain your physique regardless. And here you are trying to make your butt big. Uh, it's um, so I think it's, you know, it does a lot for bodybuilding in a positive manner, but also obviously there's a lot of drawbacks to it. Now people are using the technology for health, you know, obviously like, you know, blood work, the Dutch test, was a, which is a urine test that has a lot on it that, um, may not necessarily come up on a blood test, you know, with, in regards to kidneys and stuff like that. So there's so much more information out there. And one thing that's getting great is, and it's kind of a bad and a good thing is coronavirus has turned a lot of nurses into functional health practitioners. So you have that medical knowledge mixed in with the physique knowledge, and then you're, you're creating these amazing coaches that are going to be the way it is going forward. I mean, there's not going to be this old school, like, these old school bodybuilding coaches now, I mean, in the future, at least, I mean, you have these people that are 
phenomenal in health and, and um, biomechanics that are going to be leading the way. Um, so uh, that in one aspect is also a good reason why technology can help. You hear so much that these kids are sitting at home stuck on a computer, but yet there's two 18 year olds at the NFL combine that ran four twos. I mean, I mean it's, you know, you, you have the all time list of top 40 times and two of them were done out of the top five this year. I mean, you have people, you know, I can only imagine when you and I get in our seventies and eighties, just what these, these people, these humans <laughs> will be doing as far as what they can bench press, what they can sprint, what they, I mean, it seems like every other day, one of the, the uh, powerlifting records are being broke. You know, Usain Bolt ran a 39740. You know, they're clocking pro football players running 25 miles per hour with a football in their hands and pads. It's almost insane to think what bodybuilding will be in 20 years, what all these sports will be in 20 years, is how, you know, the human in general, humans in general have evolved and will continue to. What do you think you learned the most between that first, you know, that first, uh, that first prep and then getting ready, training and prepping for the next show you did? The biggest thing I learned is that, you know, I, I, you can't starve yourself out. Your body will, you can't like the, we talked about the leptin thing. So that show I had get the next show I had scheduled refeeds. So once a week I would have a scheduled refeed and um, it was a pretty impressive showing for me because I got third in that class, but the guy who beat me in my class turned pro at universe the very next year I, I don't remember too much about the second place guy to be honest with you so like when i got on stage i looked totally different i mean backstage there's people thinking that i was gonna go to the overall my goal to be honest with you was to get top three of that show my very first show was to get top five and open and i didn't do that i got like fifth and novice i didn't place an open but the the difference between the second and the third show was where i i really became a national level competitor and I think that's another thing that would probably be discussed at a different time. But I think everybody needs a full year if they want to truly see a change in their body. And what I would do a spring show and then I did a fall show. So I was able to improve, but it wasn't much. But when I went from taking a year off and doing the same show, coming back around, that's when my physique really changed. What do you think the optimal number of, of shows to do in a year is? I say pick a season everybody's kind of getting away from the fall. It, I don't know if you noticed, but the fall shows are really down. And the reason that is because most of the national shows are in the summer. Almost all the national shows are in the summer, except for nationals. Uh, then some of them I think are maybe late spring, but maybe, might as well say summer. I mean, May 15th, you know, let's, let's just say it's summer. So, um, so I like to compete in August. So that's kind of been my go-to now. So it gives you six, six to you know of course you got to reverse a little bit and then you kind of get into your building phase you know if you take a full year off the most that you're going to build enhanced or not most likely would be six to ten pounds so say for instance if you do a show in the spring and then you do it in the fall well half of that can be spent cutting so you can might as well say that you're going to cut that in half so what are you going to, if you put on two pounds, three pounds of muscle, what changes in your physique are you really going to be able to do display, especially if you're not there yet? Now, for somebody who's already close to being a pro, that might be enough. Now, as far as to answer your question, you can do as many shows as you want within a certain time frame. I say within a month. So like, because preps, I mean, for me, especially now, some it's harder than others. But for me, the last four weeks of prep, I'm barely sleeping. I'm basically starving. I can't think straight. Uh, for a successful person who has 15 employees that rely on getting food on the table, I have to be coherent. I can't be having brain fog for six months straight. So like, say, for instance, if you do, if you wanted to do, like, say, uh, North American, which is the first, the first week of September. So with the show I want to do, it's at the Kentucky Open. Now, the week before that is the Indiana State Championships, Battle of the States. And then the week after the Open is the Indiana or the Muncie Championships. I think it's the NPC Premier Championships. 
So technically, I could do all three of those shows and then go to North Americans, which would be fun. You know, some people like to compete more than just once. For me, you know, I'm just wanting to compete once because the, the preps are so hard on me and then get qualified. So, I, I mean, these people that do shows year-round, they never improve. Even at the pro level, you see those pros that constantly do show after show after show. They go to the Olympia, and what happens? They get smashed by the same top five every year. That same top five usually takes the whole year off to get better. They come back around, and they're around that top five once again. Occasionally, you get somebody that will, of course, sneak in. But so if you want to make improvements, you need time off. You need to be at a surplus. And in order to do that, you can't keep doing shows because obviously at show time, you haven't been in a surplus for at least 12 weeks. Why do you think that that kind of sacrifice, that kind of discipline, and that kind of you know really hardship is, is something that – you look forward to and like doing it and you just continue to do it It, it's a very good question um i always tell anybody that says you know i'm not sure if i want to do a show or not i tell them don't to do it you know you you have to be you have to enjoy this it's funny because i'm i'm really probably the wrong wrong person to ask because i really don't like i don't really enjoy being on stage i don't like i i you know i first did this to be competitive because i wanted to beat people I mean, literally, that's what I wanted to do. I want to be, get back to my competitive spirit. And then it became about marketing because, you know, when I won my Kentucky State Championship, uh, it helped me substantially in marketing. What's crazy is, you know, the general population doesn't know what an IFBB pro is. So I could tell somebody I was Mr. Kentucky, and that would hold more weight than if I was an IFBB pro. And just because they're, oh, wow, you're state champion. Well, I live in Kentucky. This is cool. I, I'm training underneath. The, the state champion so that that's a cool thing whereas if you tell somebody you're an ifbb pro the general population would be like oh, what a i mean no they won't know so right now you know i still want to be competitive i think that's part of this fun but the main thing that drives me is the marketing aspect of it and then i made a promise to myself you know back in 2017 that i was going to take three years and become a pro well three years later i missed it by one spot now after that COVID happened and then uh, last year I had the health issues that we talked about. And then now we're coming back to this year. I'm hoping to, to regain that. You know, a lot of people don't realize there's no money in bodybuilding. You have to truly love it. And I, I, you know, the only how that you can use bodybuilding as a way to make money is if you can attach it to something else, whether that be with me, like I said, I have a personal training gym. I have uh, 15 people underneath me that, you know, I could bring in people and feed people to, you know, make a living for them too. Or like, say, if you're online coaching, obviously it'll help, you know, uh, people look at you like, well, he looks great. So he has to know what he's doing, even though sometimes that's not the case. But in order for me to make it worth it, it you have to have something attached to it. You know, I mean, it, you have to find your why. And I think that probably is, is brought up so many different ways. I mean, bodybuilding is not going to buy you a Lamborghini. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, there's no, I mean, I want to say, I think the Mr. Olympia this year got like in Mensa Zeke got like $40,000 or something wow. world champion got $40,000. So now I'm, I'm really close with Andre Ferguson, which he was number two in the world for a long time. He's kind of went down a little bit since in Mensa Zeke, he actually trained at my gym during COVID and he loved it because his sponsors paid for him to live. But there's a lot that goes into that. So you have to get followers. You have to look good. You have to have a good smile. Uh, you have to be punctual. There's a lot of things that go into that. But there's very few people that get that. You know, you, I mean, there's very few people that can fit that mold where there's, they're good enough to get their sponsors to basically pay them to live. And that's kind of what you need to do to make it worth it if you're doing it fin for financial reasons. Um, I also love the fact, and I think a lot of people do it for this reason, is they want to see how far they can take their body. You know, we all, we all got into weightlifting uh, either to look better or to live healthier. Uh, most of us because of a bad breakup. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got my start. You have to find your why, man. If, if you can't find your why, that's going to be a tw really tw uh, tough 12 to 16, 20 weeks, according to how long you go. What level does does motivation, if any, play within your your training, your routine? You know, does does motivation ever factor in, or is it all just you know just doing it? 
Yeah. So motivation is a big thing. I'm going to actually pick on a uh, Cedric McMillan, which you just had on your uh, podcast. Uh, so Cedric, funny story. So um, I was already qualified to do the open. Uh, I had won an overall championship the year before. So I was already qualified for North America. So I didn't have to go do the Kentucky open. And I actually watched um, one of his videos where he was talking about how his NPC debut he was going to run through everybody and beat everybody. Well, I knew he was doing the open because he tagged him in it. Well, it kind of pissed me off. <laughs> and uh, it motivated me beyond repair because I was like, so many people, and I'm not picking on Cedric on this, but so many people just think they're just going to walk into a pro card or walk into a championship. And, uh, and I ended up doing the show because of him. Like he motivated me to do the show. And I, and if I didn't show up, he'd have been Mr. Kentucky because I beat him. So he would have, now he's a pro. Of course, he's an IBB pro now. Uh, congratulations to him on that. But he'd have a Kentucky State title underneath his belt too if he didn't open up his mouth. And it's, I use the Instagram crowd to motivate me. Now, my discipline comes from losing. Like I remember what it was like to be on that stage and watch as the first place, there's a funny uh, picture of me online. You see a fake smile on my face as I'm watching the guy who got first North Americans walk behind me, get his pro card. I remember what it was like to sit there because I wasn't hundred percent, you know, adhering on my uh, plan. Like, you know, I had a coach, you know, there's a lot of days I was starving. I ate a little, it wasn't like I was cheating bad, but it was like a little bit more oatmeal, a little bit this, a little bit of that. And once again, like I told you, I think it was like between me and the third place guy, it was like, very small and the second place guy got a pro card too so my discipline this year is the fact that like i know that i have to be 100 percent on task at all times if i don't want to feel like that again and that's where my um my discipline comes from but my motivation comes from any other competitor people run their mouths and you know uh it's a great thing for me, you know, uh, cause there's a lot of things that, you know, you'll be in the middle of the set, you know, and I'm a, a traditional hack squat type guy and I do the hard shit, you know, and there's times where you're in the middle of a hack squat and you feel like your na- legs are going to break. And then you remember what so-and-so said, or this is this person or that person said they're going to win. And it might push you through it. Whereas if you didn't have that, you won't. So, uh, that's how I get my, my motivation is, is just from others. It, it, it's a, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, with, with Cedric, I'm not mad at him about that, you know, and me and him are cool. And like, it was the fact that it was an opportunity for me to get my motivation back because it was stupid. It's stupid for me for, for, to, for thinking that, but yeah, you know, I literally thought I was going to walk through that kid and, and I ended up beating him in the overall by just one point, you know, and that woke me up. It's like, man, I, I wasn't where I was or where I thought it was from the last year. And I regressed too. You know, I didn't come in as lean as I did the previous year, and he could—he almost t- pulled it off. It is all about, you know, this the, the focus, the motivation. There's so much that anybody can do it. Now, genetics plays a big role in it, but especially at the top level, you have the top genetic guys doing everything right. They're the ones that are winning. But you can become a pro <clears throat> without having crazy genetics. You know, if you do exactly what we talked about, you have the discipline, you have the motivation, you drink your water, you sleep. I mean, you just follow that schedule of things that you need to be doing and you'll get somewhere in the sport. And what's also cool is it's not like, the, I think the number one thing that's really cool about bodybuilding over, over other sports is there is no fluke winning. Like, that's what I love about it. Like, I call them 16-week warriors. Those people that work out really hard leading up to a show, but the rest of the year they don't do a damn thing you know who does the work in bodybuilding. You know, it's not like March Madness where somebody that totally this has one game. They stun the world with one game. Like, you have all year to get ready for that one moment on stage. And whatever you put on stage is going to show what you did for that last year. That's another reason why it's tough, you know, and I get the motivation from people online because you got people that you know aren't doing the work and they look the same year after year. And they're the ones talking about winning pro cards, and that motivates the hell out of me because I want to be the one to tell them no. Um, I mean, it's there's a there's a fine 
line between arrogant and then just being confident. And I think it, uh, our sport, unfortunately, is more arrogant than confident nowadays. How do you train yourself mentally? Or, or is it just the fact that doing things over and over again and being disciplined is training enough? So that's really where it comes down to. I mean, it has to become a part, like if you're going to do great at the sport, it has to be a routine. Like it, it can't be anything other than a routine. Um, you just get involved. And you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. The mental aspect of it and focusing on just doing everything right every day, especially great. There's it's a lot of doing stuff that you don't want to do. I mean, you know, there are not many people on earth that get up to do fast cardio because they want to, you know, in the off season, like right now, you know, I'm consuming 600 grams of carbs every training day. You think I want to do that? You know, there's been times where I'm slugging out a, a two, uh, <laughs> two uh, bottles of orange juice at like 10 o'clock at night trying to get all my calories in. You know, there's a lot of stuff to be great in the sport. You just have to do the hard shit. I mean, and unfortunately, a lot of people won't do that. The difference between a hat squat and a person that sits on the leg press and does easy reps. There's there's so many things that you can that people need to do and understand. It, it's not there's not going to be an easy way there. You know, I, I love watching Nick Walker's videos. because He's one of the few per, uh, people in the bodybuilding industry that shows failure on a video. Like you watch Nick Walker train, everyone's like, oh man, how, he's 25. I think, how in the hell does he look like that? You watch his videos, he's not doing that for glamor. Like he's literally going to failure on a hack squat every single time or a leg press or leg extension or a leg curl or a squat. I mean, th that's what it takes. It takes that no reps of reserve, falling underneath the weight, you know, that's what it takes. And just most people don't have that. You know, I remember, uh, I think it was Muhammad Ali that had a great quote. They asked him how many sit-ups he could do or something like that. He's like, I have no idea because I only started counting when it started hurting. And that's, awesome. that's what bodybuilding is. Right. You know, it's what you could do in the pain. And not only that, what, what you can do when you're only taking in 1,500 calories or 1,800 calories and you're a 200-pound man. <laughs> you know that's a you know that's something that a lot of people don't talk about too is when they get into bodybuilding there's like everybody thinks like oh well i don't mind being hungry no the hunger is is nothing compared to like the mental fog the the sleepless nights um the tripping over nothing it's there it's dropping your food because you, you can't feel your senses as well as you normally could um the constant you know your stomach issues a lot of digestion issues during prep We've already talked about the hormonal issues. That's the shit that people don't talk about or know about that haven't done a show. It's like, oh, well, I could be hungry, so I could do a show. <laughs> Man, the hunger is the last thing on my mind. I was okay starving until it cost me three nights of sleep. Right. You know, then you can't, how are you going to function? You're starving. The only thing you can do is drink water. You live off bang energy drinks. <laughs> it's not good, man. So what do you think the future holds for you, you know, when it comes to, you know, said you use this, this uh, sport a lot for competition as well as marketing, but, but what do you think, you know, what do you think the end of the day, you know, you finally hang it up. What do you think it looks like for you? So I've always had a goal of just turning pro. Like I, I'm a guy that wanted a certain physique and right now my physique is it. Like, if I rebuild what I have right now, it's exactly what I've always wanted. And it's going to happen in August. Now, with that being said, I don't feel like I should do a competition if I won't be competitive. So, you know, men's physique and men's classic, because I'm going to do both, it's, it's dwarfed into something a lot bigger bodies than what I had imagined for myself. So my goal is to... Uh, win a couple state championships this year, uh, win a, uh, a championship to get my pro card. I mean, just winning my class or getting second in my class. But I want to win my class, don't get me wrong, but getting the pro card. And I would like to do uh, the Kentucky Muscles, a pro show. And sometimes they'll flip back and forth. Sometimes I have men's physique, sometimes I have class physique. I'll probably do one pro show and then I'll be done. Uh, you know, that's really what I, I mean. I'm 30, uh, going to be 38 this year in August. I started when I was 33. I mean, I wouldn't even, 
you know, I was barely lifting any time before that. So I started from like when most people's prime was coming up, I was getting my start. So, you know, I was so far behind. I mean, if you look at my photos from 2017 to now, I'm a totally different man. And, and that's really my goal is just to turn pro and then um, do one show just so uh, my friends and family can see me on stage as a pro and then kind of ride off in the sunset. You know, for people, for young guys, for any age person really wanting to get into this sport, wanting to succeed at this sport, what would be, you know, some of your best advice for them? Hire a great coach and it takes time. That And the second one probably being just as important as the first one. When I say great coach, I mean, it's really hard to find a great coach. I don't know. I, I take that back. It's not hard to find a, a great coach. It's hard to get through the smoke of those who are not great coaches. So make sure that you do your research when you find your coach. But the second, and I believe the most important thing is it takes time. And the reason I say that, you know, and I think the younger generation has this uphill battle more than I did, is they want it right. Everybody wants it right away. You know, they see these young, I mean, that guy, um, that guy finished top five in Olympia in classics, like 23 years old. You know, and then you got Nick Walker at 25. Them guys are not you. <laughs> so they're genetic specimens. They're freaks. They're once in a generation type people. It takes time. And, you know, there's, there's people like, I mean, I know people that have competed one time and got like fifth and novice and are starting a road to pro for the next year. It's not going to happen. Like, all you have to do is just go to the NPC News Online and look at the people that are turning pro. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm 210 pounds right now. I'll probably have a stage weight of 175. And I'll be in Class A, most likely, or maybe even Class B. There's people that are in Class D at my weight that think they're turning pro this year. It takes time. Like, if you're 6'3", you have to be 200-plus to turn pro in any division, no matter what it is, any division. Um, and then have the, the symmetry to match that. It's not an easy road. And, you know, enjoy the process. As soon as you turn pro, you're most likely never going to win a show again in your life. I mean, why not enjoy it now? You get in front of your friends and family. I mean, those pro shows, most of them aren't around wherever you live. You know, even if you live in a major city, there might be one at the max two pro shows in your area where your friend and family can go. And most people don't even have that. So what happens when you turn pro? Okay, you go from one of the best amateurs in the nation to the bottom of the pool, and then nobody gets to watch you. You go off, you get into airports, you fly a couple states over, get 15th out of 20, fly back. Yeah, enjoy the process, you know, uh, win a couple of national or I'm sorry, win a couple of shows in your area, win a state championship, you know, do enjoy the process, do do some of the local shows, do some of the regional shows that are out a little bit, enjoy the process, don't rush to the top because once it's lonely up there, <laughs> the pro league is so big and they give out so many different pro cards each year. It's one of those things that there's no reason to rush, especially I mean, like during COVID, it's kind of a little bit off topic, but not much. But there's a lot of people that snuck in the league during COVID. A lot of people. And they went and did a pro show and got absolutely demolished because they had no right getting on a pro stage. So why why do that? And, like, why do a national show and hope you get in just so you have to sit out for four or five years before you become competitive? I mean, there's, there's pros right now that are getting on stage with people 20, 30 pounds heavier than them. It takes a long time to put on that type of muscle. So why try to sneak in? Why not build a body that's a pro body instead of building a time frame? That's what I did wrong is I built a time frame. I went to turn pro in three years, starting from scratch. I almost did it. I tell you what, I did it live after that show. And I said, I wasn't ready is why I didn't turn pro. It had nothing to do with my prep, nothing to do with my coach, nothing to do with water. I just wasn't ready. And I got beat. And I'm glad I did because if I went and did a pro show the following year, I got my ass beat badly <laughs> so uh my advice would be to hire a great coach and be patient if you want to before we head out real quick just let people know where they can find you on social media and, and all that good stuff it'd be cool it's a team uh underscore lift underscore heavy underscore things uh is my instagram uh by solutions uh is my uh one-on-one -on -one personal training facility and my coaching 
And then my group fitness uh, facility is Home Fit Personal Training. Uh, all of us out of Louisville, Kentucky, in uh, St. Matthews. Awesome, man. Well, like I said, it was good having you on, and I appreciate your time, and I look forward to putting this one out there.